It's got to be a good balance. We're going to, you know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to put a holder on that because we're going to get to that in, in a little bit. Um, the reality is not much. A good fact or two is good. Too much is overkill. And what we're talking about is how do you make a fact or a statistic meaningful? Okay, so we'll talk about that um, a little bit more. So, did you want to? Because sometimes facts, sometimes facts, again, aren't, if, again, we're storytellers, right? We, got, we, we need to start thinking and storytelling. So how many have read a book that has a ton of facts and statistics and has no story and just bores you to death, right? You last about three pages. You're probably better than I am. I last two pages. Um, so that you've got to have everything woven in. And too, much fact, too many facts and statistics um, um, will ruin it honestly. Okay, so state of the media. Where's the media today? So think about when you watch the news, when you read the paper, everything. Are they educating? Are they informing? Or are they entertaining? It is, more enter it is more about entertaining. And maybe entertaining is not the right word. Maybe it's keeping your attention, right? So that's why there's always a teaser before they go to the break, because they've got to try to give, give you a reason to stay for two minutes to come back and not channel flip, right? So one of the things to think about is where the media is today is more about getting your attention and keeping your attention, okay? Where they were 20, 30 years ago was a little bit more information education. One of the things, although this is starting to change a little bit too, the Latino press is, has been, and some, of the, some, some other ethnic press as well, is where general market press was 15, 20 years ago. They still view themselves a little bit more as educators, as informers, and to a certain extent, certain extent advocates for their community. If you can get the press, if we can get the press more to think about that advocate role, they are getting the airways. If we can get them to think more about the advocate role, that's where we can step in. So what we're seeing now is Spanish language press, a lot of times it's, you know, Univision in the morning show, you know, we'll take a little bit more of what's, what does my community need to hear. Other stations, General Market will do that, but right now we're at a place where ethnic press is doing that more, still views themselves a little bit more as an, as an informer, as an advocate for their, for their community. But one of the things you're seeing that I didn't see when I started doing PR is, especially when you start talking about smaller publications, smaller radio stations, there used to be a very direct line, a very heavy line between advertising and editorial. That line is not so big anymore. And a lot of times, especially when you get to community newspapers, it's a husband and wife, and they're both doing the same thing. One might be leading, it's a family, maybe they have an employee or two, um, they don't have a lot of people to create a lot of content. And so that line is getting blurred between editorial and advertising. And so they're having to think more. So when, when I would start calling the media when I first got out of college in, in 90, I'd be pitching a story and that's all I'd be talking to someone about was a story. Well over the years, now, if I pitch someone a story, a lot of times the first question I'm going to get is, do you have any ad dollars to support this? Is more and more the common. When you get to the, big, the bigger folks, it, it, it doesn't exist. But it's, but it's even starting to climb there a little bit as well. But especially if you get to a small publication, they've got to pay the bills every day. So, so that's a little bit how they're reacting. What kind of things are the, are the media covering today? We talked about a little bit. They're covering. You know, the, the old adage still, still sits, if it bleeds, it leads, okay? They've got to get, to the, the, they're trying to grab attention. So that's a lot of where, where they are right now. There's some, there's some media, and you can look in, in any city, if you watch your 5 o'clock, your 6 o'clock, your 10 o'clock, or 11 o'clock news, there are some stations that you can still see 
are a little bit more about informing, about keeping people updated on issues, um, you can tell pretty quickly the ones that are really just tr trying to grab attention versus, um, versus a little bit more sensationalism. One of the issues that we're dealing with is experts at media outlets are becoming more and more rare. So especially in bigger papers, medium-sized papers, TV, say, there was, everybody had a beat, right? Someone covered education, someone covered healthcare. Years ago, some of the medium to larger size dailies would have four or five different people covering healthcare. I used to do a lot of healthcare work. They'd have a healthcare business, they'd have a healthcare medicine, they'd have a, a healthcare fitness, they'd have XXX. And some of them over, you know, crossed over. But nowadays, what you have is fewer and fewer beats. So you don't have people that have an expertise in the issue. I used to talk to healthcare reporters who frankly knew more about healthcare than most of the people that in the company that I was with because they'd just been covering it and they were experts in the field. Nowadays, what you have more of, especially when you get to radio or TV, is people who are covering a wide array of stories, so they don't have the expertise. So you don't necessarily have an environment, environmental reporter anymore or nature, or someone who, who is an expert on drought or an expert on the environment. So they might get handed a drought story, and we'll talk a little bit more about this process and deadlines and, and the conversation Cindy and I had about why to get back to them so quickly, is people are getting a story and having to, become, having to come up to speed on that issue to write a story by the end of the day or to film a story by the end of the day. So it's going to really play into what, how you interact with them and the kind of information you provide to them. Okay, so go in, go in knowing that. Um, I like to say, and, and I've had some journalism friends who take, take exception to this, um, reporters almost have to act like they're the laziest people on the earth. Because any given day, they could be handed a story and they've got to get a draft in by 3.30 or 2.30 or mid-afternoon. They don't have time to reinvent the wheel at that day, at that point. They've got to go with whoever's on their Rolodex, whoever it was the last press release from. They've got to work efficiently. They don't have time to start doing a ton of legwork and then and run all over town. And they're not necessarily experts on the issue anymore. So it's really whoever's going to spoon, sometimes spoon feed them the most because that's the reality of their day, okay? They have to work effectively, they have to work efficiently. Sometimes they're doing multiple stories. So they've really gotta, they've, they've really gotta work. Again, Latino and general market press, um, again, Latino is where I would say general market was 15 to 20 years ago. They still view themselves as an advocate. It's starting to be less and less. It's, it's starting to come more in line with, with general market press, but but what we see typically is we still see a little bit more of that advocacy, advocacy role. So let's talk a little bit about more of the reporter. So there's always been this love-hate relationship for a reporter, right? Um, anybody who's my age or around my age or maybe a little older remembers the hard copy show, right? Does everybody remember hard copy? Okay. Um, there was a couple shows like, the, and it was more, it was attack journalism, right? This was the show that, you know, inevitably they were showing up as some executive or physician or attorney who was in trouble was leaving their office out of the, the back door and they'd say it's the back door, it's actually just the door that, to the parking lot, but they'd call it the back door and, um, and ambush, it was, all, it was all ambush journalism, right? It was sensationalized. So with that, and, and so people have always had this love-hate relationship with the media and, and with, with reporter. What happens when you have that approach is you're typically not going to have a good interaction. And you're typically not going to get the most out of it because it becomes good guy, bad guy, right? White hat, black hat. And you're trying, to, and, and you take an approach of you're fighting with them or you're keeping something from them or you're going to give them only what you want to give them in a negative way. And so the problem with that is you typically don't get a good story. You just don't have a good interaction. And the reality is you're not that different from a reporter. 
The reporter and you have the same goal. At the end of the day, they want a good story. At the end of the day, you want a good story. You want an accurate story. They want an accurate story. So in the newspaper, remember the old days when newspapers used to be delivered, thrown on your front doorstep, um, and they were folded in half? Or they were folded and then rolled? When you opened the paper, it was folded in half. The goal of every reporter that wrote for the main news section was to be on the front page above the fold. Right? Does that make sense? Folds above the fold. It's the same thing for a television reporter. I want my story in the first five minutes. That's what they're all shooting for. The reality is that's what you want as well. If, you, if they're doing a story on trees and drought, you want it front page. You don't want it page C6. You don't want it in the last 10 minutes of the news. You want it in the first five minutes. So the goals are the same. So if you, if you accept that you're actually trying to get to the same process, a good, informative story, then you're all going to have success. Okay? So I know it's hard, and I know we often have that adversarial um, relationship. Um, what they are going to do is make you work at it, especially on days where maybe it just wasn't they called you or you called them, you had a relationship with someone and you, you generated a story or something came up and you called one specific person. Heaven forbid you send out a press release. Because if you send out a press release, what the reporter knows is you sent the same press release to 100 people or 30 people or statewide you send it to 500 people. And so if they like the story and if they want to do something that day, they also know that 500 other people could have liked the same thing and worked on the same story. So what they need to get out of you is something different. What they need to get out of you is something you didn't say 500 times earlier that day to 500 other reporters. They're going to try to get something out of Steve that's a little different, right? It's a Tribune in your town? The, oh, Loda. Oh, San Luis is over here. Okay. Um, so the news center, they know you probably talked to the Stockton Record. Depending on how far up, you may have talked to the Merced Sun. You know, they want a little something a little different so that their story is not the exact same as everybody else. Or not the exact same quote that you gave to the radio station. So that's a little bit of what they're going to look for. So what do they need to tell the news? We talked a little earlier about what do you need to tell a good story. Similar items. What does the media need to tell a story? Immediacy? When is it happening? If it happened six months ago, it's not newsworthy. Okay? So it's got to be immediate. It's got to be now. Proximity? They're not going to write in Lodi about something that's only happening down in Santa Barbara. It's got to have impact on my market. It's got to have impact on, on, my local, on my local geography. Consequence. What happens if? In this instance, what happens if not? What happens to a tree if we stop watering them? What happens if everybody starts watering their lawn twice a day, seven days a week? Okay, those types of things. Prominence, how important is it? On a scale of one to ten, is it, is it, gonna, is it something that needs to be in the first five minutes or, or, or is it kind of just a feel-good story that the news wraps, you know, the, the stories the news wraps up with every night? Drives you crazy, the, the one positive story is at the last five minutes of the, sh of the show? Conflict, right? We talked about it earlier. Is there, is there two sides to the issue? What's going to happen if, if this person, if this side wins, if this side wins? What's the conflict? Um, slice of life. This is otherwise known as the water cooler conversation. Is it going to generate water cooler conversation? Is it going to hit people where they really live? Okay. Uniqueness. How different is it? Is what we're doing in... Sacramento, different than what's happening in Bakersfield, or different, how unique is it in our setting, or how unique is this issue? Suspense. I don't know that we're going to have a lot of suspense, but um, these are the elements that they're going to look for. And they're going to look for wide audience appeal. If only five people care about it in a county, probably not going to generate a story. Is enough people going to care about it? And maybe different people are going to care about different elements. So maybe I've got a story that I can cover a couple of different angles. Here's, how it's, here's why farmers are going to care about it. Here's why moms are going to care about it. Here's why schools are going to care about it. If I, can, if I can have one story that covers a couple different angles, here's how the local economic picture is going to be impacted by this. Okay? Then 
then it's got multiple wide audience appeals. It appeals to multiple, multiple audiences. What does a reporter need to tell their story? Okay, back to storytelling again. So they're all a little different. So print, facts, details, figures. If you're USA Today, you need color charts. Okay, you need color pictures. So keep in mind of what, who you're talking to and what they need. Print stories are typically going to be the longest. So they need the most information. They might talk to the most people. You might see three, four different people in a front page story. Three to four different people quoted is not uncommon. Okay? So they need facts, they need figures, they need, they need detail. Okay? And they need people to quote. They need people to quote. So start thinking in your organization. We'll talk about this a little bit more when you is selecting, but start thinking about you guys are all going to be ready to go back and be spokespeople. Okay? And we want you to be ready to go because that's one thing they need. They need a good quote. Radio, clear overview sound bites. What we mean by clear overview is when's the last time you heard a, a radio news story? How long is it? If, if, if it's not NPR. If it's not NPR. Because if it's, if it's, <laughs> those are great because sometimes those can be longer. But the typical, your typical AM station that has news, 30 seconds? And how long are the quotes? Five seconds, seven seconds, tops. If someone doesn't feel like doing a lot of vetting, you might get to 10 seconds. But if it's a 30 second, 45 second story, you're now at a third of the story, a third of the time, right? My math is right. So, um, so often what a radio <coughs> reporter needs, and again, radio, very few beats. Newspaper, you'll still get to some beats, but again, they've cut down like we've talked about. Radio, very few people have beats. Okay, unless you're at the Capitol and they've got a couple of Capitol Bureau reporters, you know, with Capitol Public Radio. Someone might be covering call politics, someone might be covering local news. Other than that, very little beats. They cover everything. So when they show up, you're gonna need to give them two minutes, one minute would be preferable, of what the story's about. They got a press release, they got a call. They read something. A lot of times what generates TV and radio for the day is something maybe that came out in the morning newspaper. Okay, that's sometimes what signals them. So they may have read a little bit. They need to come to you. And what we're seeing more of now are, are reporters showing up and saying, all right, tell me why we're here today. And that's your, that's your, that's your overview. That's your overview time. Okay, so you've got to give them the big picture quickly. Okay, and then, then they'll actually ask you for a quote. That type of thing. Um, television. What does television news need? They need interviews. They need pictures, right? They need good footage. They need B-roll, background footage. So think about that. If we're if we're doing a tree story, what would be ideal for for video? Trees, right? Grass. Maybe the right mixture. Maybe the Maybe some video of someone who's actually deeply watered a mature tree so that people actually know what that means. I'm still not sure I know what it means. Okay? Um, you know, now we're hearing the, the, the tagline, let the grass go gold, California gold. It's a nice touch, actually. So what does that look like? So, so TV, they need the quick overview. Okay? But again, a TV story is going to be 60 seconds. So again, your interviews may be going to be a little longer than radio, but it's still going to be 10 seconds. So we'll talk about this a little bit more. But if you give them a rambling three minutes of footage, when they get back, either the reporter or the editor, sometimes it's both, you know, they're editing the story, they're in, in the van, they have to then figure out what's the most important piece. If you give them three minutes of different rambling stuff. If you give them consistent, concise messaging and keep going back to one or two key messages, it's going to make it easier for them to guess at what was important. And it's going to be easier for you in knowing that your true message, your priority message got out. Instead of sitting at the six, 
watching and recording the 6 o'clock news and hoping, I hope they got the right message because I gave them three minutes of rambling, okay? This is what we were talking about with Cindy. Deadlines are crucial. So when a reporter calls for a client now, um, I used to be corporate-based, I used to be at a trade association, and, and at one point was um, communications, VP of communications for the California Association of Health Plans, HMOs, right? It's a very popular guy. Spokesperson for the state HMO association, okay? Um, the first question when I, did, when I get a call, write down the information. Who is it? What's the story going to be about? I'd also ask, who else are you talking to? Most important question, what's your deadline? What's your deadline? Sometimes it's, you know what, I need to talk to you right now. I need to get a quote right now over the phone. Or if it's television, it's, I need to be there by, by 10 o'clock in the morning or 3 o'clock. What's your deadline? Oftentimes, for now, for a client, we don't typically go on the record. We're grabbing the client. So I have to ask, what's your deadline? When, when can I get back to you? When do I get back to you? The goal there is not to just meet the deadline. Although some people will use that as a tactic. It might depend on how hard, how badly you actually want to get in the story. If I, wanna, if I want to frame the story, I want to be the first person they talk to. And while I've got them on the phone, I'm going to say, so what's the story about? What I, where, where, are you, where are you going with the story? Or where are you trying to get? How can I help? And then I'm starting to feed them information. Because I want to frame the story as much as I can. And if I need to get someone else to talk to them, I'm going to try to get someone to talk to them in the next 15 minutes. Because the sooner I can weigh in, the sooner I can impact the story on a greater, greater basis. The sooner I can, the more I can frame what the story's going to end up looking like. If I don't, if, if I have to find someone else, another expert at the company, or, or I can't get back to them till 3 o'clock in the afternoon, what I'm assuming is I'm going to be a little blip in the story if I make the story at all. Now, sometimes I would use that as a tactic if I really didn't want to play that big in the story or was hoping that our organization wasn't going to be the first one talked about. Then I might call them back. Then I might arrange an interview at 4 o'clock in the afternoon or get back to them late. But you've got to balance that because you're also relationship building. Relationships are key. When it, comes, when it comes to working with the media. So I want to, you want to be helpful, you want to be a resource, and you want to build that relationship. So it's typically as soon as you can get back to them because you can frame the story, you have the most possibility and potential to frame the story. So you want to get back to them as soon, as soon as possible. Don't ever miss a deadline. I would assume We'll go old school here, talk about Rolodexes. Assume that if you miss a deadline, the chances of you getting called for the next story have gone down, maybe to zero. Because the last thing a reporter needs or wants is to be relying on Diana to finish out the story, and Diana doesn't call me back when I've got to get it to my editor. Now I've got a hole I've got to fill. Okay. So my trust in Diana has gone down. And I'm not really going to be all that confident that Diana is going to get back to me the next time I need her. OK? So well, deadlines are crucial. What? Well, I know if, uh, sometimes get complaints that a lot of these issues are either calls or voicemails. Um, and that's not It's, it is better, a couple words of advice. It is better than not calling them back at all. And then it's up to you to, to main, try to maintain the relationship. If you are, if you want media attention, then you have to make sure they can get a hold of you. Okay? So I'll, I'll put Cindy on the spot a little bit. That, that's why, and I think I scolded you in a nice way, didn't I? Um, and, and here, but here, here was the main, here was, remember the main reason I said that? Is because you guys had sent out a press release. So 
one of the biggest mistakes you can make. If I send, out, if I send you, Mr. Reporter, a press release, I'm signaling that I want you to do a story. So I should be available. That, that, was, that was why I scolded Cindy, because you sent out a press release. You're signaling you want coverage. So on those days, you're going to get random days. Once you create relationships, you, that's when you're going to get more, and you're going to be out at a conference. You're going to be somewhere, and you're going to be in a two-hour meeting, and you've turned your phone off. Okay? When, I'm, when, I'm, when I'm with a client, I'm typically, I've turned my phone off, because it's just more professional. So you are going to have those times. Know, your, know the media cycle. Know when you're trying to get press. If you're sending out press releases, make sure you've got an army of people ready to respond. That is not the day. Any given, if someone calls, see, if someone calls you randomly and they couldn't, can't get you that day, that's going to be more forgiving than, than Marjorie sent them a press release and I can't get a hold of Marjorie. Okay? Cindy's going to defend herself now. <laughs> It, it does, not, so, not as much as succeeding, but trying is good. Um, here's the reality. Here's what you're dealing with, and it's become more and more like that, is you're dealing with the, 20, you're dealing with the constant evolving news cycle. Okay? Again, when I started in 90, there was not 24-hour news shows and, you know, on. They weren't filling news constantly. You actually had a news cycle. And we'd wait. We'd say, okay, a bad story. Okay, we just got to write out the news cycle. 24 hours, it'll be gone, or 48 hours. You'd guess at the news cycle. Now it's happening so fast that you're actually getting that because they want to be the first. It's not so much everybody has a 6 o'clock news or everybody puts out a story the next day. They want to be the first person to put up the story. Yeah, it's going to print tomorrow in the SAC B, but it's going to go live online as soon as you get back to them, and they can, and they can put a first draft. What it also means is happening right now is more errors. How many grammatical spelling errors are you seeing on newspapers these days? Or on TV websites, new, you know, broadcast news websites, or just online news sites? It's because they're racing to be the first one to get it up. Because when everybody tweets the story or posts it on their Facebook, they want to be the outlet that gets retweeted. They want to be the outlet that gets post posted on Facebook as opposed to the other 700 that are going to write the same story. So what you're dealing with in that instance is a race. That's a little bit of the state of, of what we're dealing with with the press. So, so it, is, it is tough. It is tough. And especially on an unknown day when you just get the random call, because you're not necessarily ready for it. Now you're all going to be more ready for it. You're going to be a little better prepared as spokespeople. You're gonna, we're going to walk you through a messaging exercise, which you're going to do every time you're going to do an interview. Don't just, unless you really got the messages down and you really need to be to frame that story, go ahead and talk right now. If not, try to buy yourself a few minutes to at least think through, okay, this is what the story is about. What are my top three messages? We'll go over developing those. Okay? What's that? So this is what the layer of the second just changes. This is like the reporter that turns to you and you do an ask mm -hmm. and a story. Um, this isn't really to be viewed like if you were trying to do a letter to the editor or you were contacting the editor directly. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, so this is more about a news story. Yeah, this is more about a news story. Um, we'll talk a little bit more about letters to the editor and op eds. Um, Again, that's a lot of relationship building, because if they know you, if they know your organization, and they see a good article, a good letter to the editor, or an op-ed piece from Jose's organization, and we like them, we trust them, they give us good information, the, 
that's, you're more likely to get that poke picked up as opposed to them never having heard from you before. So one of the things, so there's two, we've kind of been talking about two scenarios. One of them is you get the random call, right? You get the random call for a, from AP, and you're tra trying to scramble to get folks. If you're, if it's a, so that's, you're going you're gonna to be scrambling. Hopefully you've got people ready, hopefully you've got statistics, hopefully you've got stuff ready for, for story elements. On a day you send out a press release, you better have all those things lined up ready to go. You better, the, the biggest way to get a story is to hand them a complete story. And one of the things I will tell folks is, if you really want a good story, if you want to make sure we get one or two hit it out of the park stories, don't send out a press release. Let me go to my relationships. Let me go to the reporters that have covered us, that know our issue, that we can sit down with and, and help work a story. Because again, press releases generate a, sometimes a lot of little stuff, but what, sometimes what you really want is one or two good quality pieces as opposed to just two paragraph stories. So what you call, when, you, when you're pitching a story, sending out a press release or just, and maybe it's just a press release to two people or you're sending out an email pitch to someone, what you're going to give them is as much of the story as possible. Here's the story. Here's the story about trees. And if you need it, and here's some photo. We have photos, or we have a place where you can go get photos or B-roll for, for, um, for video, for TV. Here's, a, here's an expert. Here's a tree expert you can talk to. Here's a drought expert. Here's a farmer you can talk to. Here's X. If you hand them a complete story, they don't have to do as much running around. They will still probably call a couple other people because they're not just going to give everything you spoon fed them. But the more complete the story you can give them, the better your chances are that the story is going to come out the way you want. So a lot of times, I would, when I was a spokesperson for, for some companies, I knew and a lot of times it was on it was on a political issue, on legislative, on legislation that was moving through or not moving through, and we were either trying to pass it or kill it, you know, what everybody does with legislation. There's two sides. I typically knew my opposition, and knew which messages they were really driving home. So a lot of times I would actually try to direct a reporter to the opposition that I wanted them to talk to. If I was the first one they talked to, oh, and I'm sure, you're gonna, I'm sure you've already talked to X. Well, maybe they hadn't, but I want to put that in their mind. Because I've got better arguments for X than Y. Or Y've just got a better story than X or W. Um, or maybe T's argument I know is really silly, and that's the one I want. In my, that's the one I want printed from my opposition. So the earlier you can, the earlier you can weigh in and the more that you can hand them, even even opposition. What's going to happen sometimes then is they're going to come back and forth. Well, W just told me this. What do you say? Okay. I know as soon as I say, they're going to go back to W and go get that site again. Okay. But start thinking in complete, complete stories. Is our issue newsworthy? Yeah? Why? Not just drought, let's go, let's, so we've been talking some drought, let's go to trees now. Newsworthy. And important, important is, I, I'm always going to ask, to who? So, and I, I, we'll, we'll get to this a little, a little bit more. Um, there, there's a term that we use called true believers. So I know trees are going to be important to you all. And what happens sometimes is true believers that are living with it, dying with it, starving with it every day, sometimes have a tendency 
to think everybody feels exactly like they do. And I've, and I've already heard a couple of those comments this morning. So we've got to always make sure that we're typically not talking to true believers. So we've got to figure out how to make it important or newsworthy to them. I'm glad you brought that up. Because we live it, right? It's our life. It's not someone else's. So we, we have to understand how to get, how to move away from true believer. Um, because sometimes that comes across as arrogant. Because we're so invested in it that we don't see how someone else wouldn't be. Okay? So it's one of the things we have to think about. So with that, so is it newsworthy? How is it life changing? Potentially life changing. Potentially. Okay. So I'm going to keep pushing you guys. Why does that matter? So there's. I'm playing a little devil's advocate. Don't shoot me. Why is that important if there's urban trees? Melody? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Do we have a figure? Does anybody know what kind of savings or if you have a, a significant shade tree? Okay. Okay. That's good. That's important. 30%. That's significant. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Mm-hmm. 
Yeah, and, and as, as I mentioned before, different things are going to resonate with different people. Okay? I, I don't see our utility bill. My wife pays that. 30% sounds significant. I actually don't know what the dollar amount equates to because she pays it. So, you know, understanding, so, but that would mean a lot to her. And 30% sounds a lot to me. She, has, she would have the dollar amount in her head. You know, there's some people who just like it. There's some people, it, it has a certain attachment, okay? I've, I've marked off, as my kids have grown, on the side of this, on the bark of the tree. I've, I planted a tree. I, my kids swung on this tree. I get fruit from this tree. So understanding the different things that are going to resonate with the audience and understanding even to the publication, who that publication is it, if you're in Sacramento, is it Good Day Sacramento? The majority of people watching Good Day Sacramento would be people getting ready for work or stay-at-home moms. That's, that's their target audience. So if you're going to be on that show, you aim towards something that's going to resonate with them. So understand the publication, the media outlet, and who they might be targeting um, in, that, in that news broadcast at that certain time, um, who their publication reaches, and, and how they're going to how they're going to resonate. Where do we fit in? Assuming it's newsworthy, okay? Where do we fit in? And how do we make it more newsworthy? Can we make it more newsworthy? Separate. How do we make it more newsworthy to the regular world and true believer? I assume you've all brought, bought in, right? So how do we make it more newsworthy, and how do we become a bigger part? How do we fit into what they need? Diana? So localizing it and actually pointing, pointing to it, yes. giving them a visual. Hmm? Claire, right? What is that based on?
but I, I think what that concern is growing from is they haven't covered it in the past. I would dare say, not, not to be scolding anybody, you just haven't done a good job of selling it. And so let me be very candid. Part of the problem, I try not to offend anybody, part of the problem with true believer is you get so wrapped up in it, and I believe it, why doesn't everybody believe it? Why doesn't everybody feel it the way I feel it? And what you're start, what a lot of times what you're projecting in the messaging turns into me true believer. So one of the things, that's why I'm asking, how do we become more newsworthy? Because we have to start thinking that we are not talking to anybody in this room. Again, I assume you're all committed to this issue. I assume you've all bought in. I don't need to speak to you about this issue. What I need to, I need to reach is the non-true believer. And so we've got to figure out what's going to resonate with them. Is it fine? Is it 30%? Is it, is it the danger of you know, the limb falling down on two campers? Okay? I'm dealing with, with another client. I'm dealing in a community where, um, where they were saying trees weren't being watered. And, and some folks believe it's now brought um, some infestation of bugs as the trees die. So it's, one, it's what we're here to talk about is how do we take you beyond true believer to actually getting messaging that will resonate? Because I... We could, yeah. Eventually, you can, you can test messaging and things. But there is enough within your group. You, you know, you guys should all know the, the economic messages and, and emotional messaging that may resonate. You all know those, those issues, right? I'm assuming in this room? OK. That's where, that's where we need to start. Then you can start testing them and seeing how it's working.
So I'm going to bring us back for a second. So, oh, go ahead, Marjorie. So, yeah, and one of the things, you know, there's, and we're going to talk a little bit more, um, a, a little later about direct outreach and social media and some of those things. Um, but I think one of the things we do, we do have to start thinking about, and Cindy and I have talked about this, is, you know, what we're talking today primarily is media. How do we use the media? How do you effectively, so that you guys are better equipped to use the media in this, in this instance? But what we're seeing a lot of, the type of work we're doing more is media is a part of it. 20, 10, 20 years ago when I started, 15 years ago even, it was even 10 years ago, number one priority for, for, for PR was to get in the press. We wanted news stories. We wanted newspaper. Now that's a part of it. What we're also looking at now is how do we communicate directly, whether it's routine email blasts, whether it's social media, whether it's more grassroots, those types of things. So we'll actually talk about that a little bit tomorrow. We've got, I think, 45 minutes to talk about that tomorrow. Um, and we're going to actually run you through a process. Because what you're talking about is audience determination. Um, it's one of the things we'll talk about more tomorrow um, at tomorrow's conference. Is, um, and, and I'll actually run you through the process. Um, because you, you need to start segmenting your audiences and then build messages that work for that audience. So, Today we're talking more about media, um, but you know these will work. And, and maybe today, when we maybe when we do a um, tech uh, the interviews, maybe we'll do a couple media interviews, and maybe we'll do a couple <laughs> scenarios where you're talking to someone else because it's the same. It's still the same tips and techniques, as Cindy said earlier in the day. Yeah, I just yep. Well, here's what we always talk about. So before, we used to do this a lot more when I was doing more legislative work, media on, on kind of media related to legislative work. Rather than just going into a legislator and saying, you're, you should vote this way because your constituents feel this way, take them some media stories that already talk about it. If it's playing in their media, they're going to assume their, their constituents care about it because the media wouldn't be writing about it or doing stories about it. So one, of the, so, so one of the things you can use this for is you then start, if, if it really needs to be an issue that, your, that elected officials or school superintendent or school board members need to see, they need to hear it from you directly. But it's also going to give you good cover. And it's going to send it a different playing in the press. If you can get a story out of it, gives it greater credibility. Because now it's a community issue. Now it's the media, now it's, right, now the Stockton Record's covering it. Now the LA Times is covering it. And it's not just something that 
someone that, who, care, who works for a tree organization came in and talked to me about. My community must care about it because the LA Times is writing about it, okay? Or the Riverside Press Enterprise is writing about it. That's gonna suddenly signal to an elected official, to a school board member, to, a princip to other people that you're trying to reach out to that it is a bigger picture issue and maybe I should start caring about it. No, the goal is to piggyback on anything you can use. Yeah, the, the, one of the things, you know, we're, right now we're talking about how to, how to pitch kind of the, the direct, a lot of it's gonna be trees related to drought. But what you're gonna be looking at is where else can I, that makes sense, you don't wanna just plug into something that doesn't make sense, um, but where else can I, can I effectively throw in a tree message? Yeah, the, the more you can connect your issue to other issues, then you also bring in a greater audience. Some, suddenly you bring in trees out of an environment that, that brings down crime, X. Then you suddenly bring in the police chief and police officers and you know, neighborhood watch folks and different things like that. So the more you can, that's a true connection, um, uh, will work. And then you've got to really work on make on explaining those connections um, to folks as well. <laughs>